episode of Screen Preach. I have noticed that ever since I got the whole desk set up, I can't stop tapping it. It's like a thing that now it's my new thing. This is what I do a lot during the show. I will try to refrain because it's like a little tick thing or something. I don't know. But how are we doing? How is everybody's week? Uh, if you watch Sound of Metal, comment below on that episode. Let me know what you thought of the film and everything, you know? Uh, definitely a deep, deep one. And this week we switch it up, change gears for something a little different. It's episode 54, and we're going to talk about a film from one of my f- low-key favorite filmmakers. Um, and we will also do a lot of the segments uh, themed around that filmmaker as well. The thing about this film was I just watched it in theaters too. Got a fucking ticket parking too. I thought I found the perfect spot, but they still fucking find a way to get you here in this city. There's no leeway. It didn't look like a spot either that would get fucking ticketed, but somehow they find a way. So yeah, we're still working on that. My theater, my theater was the arc light, man. That was my go-to. You know, that historic place, loved it. Oh, it had a nice setup. I found the perfect parking for it. Now I've switched over to TCL, to the Chinese Theater on, on Hollywood Boulevard. Another historic one, you know, so that's cool and everything. And it is a, a cool theater. It's it's cool. Um, yeah, got to keep working on not getting, got to keep working on the parking but yeah, fresh off of it, Wrath of Man, episode 54. Um, and uh, what else am I watching? You know, it's funny, I, I've been watching the Netflix Marvel shows over again and watching Jessica Jones season three for the first time. Great fucking season, by the way. Probably the best season. Uh, and that is done. Like, I'm going to be done with it in the next couple days and I'm going to move on to some things that I know I want to see people telling me to see I want to check out Invincible people are watching that I want to check out Attack on Titan and some other things in the superhero realm Attack on Titan is an anime but Invincible superhero kind of shows that, that I know I want to see that are not even Marvel or DC some of them are but I want to see some things that uh Oh, for example, like the boys, Umbrella Academy, stuff like that. So that'll be next coming up for me. And then, of course, the movies. Uh, I'm going to rewatch some movies, too. And, of course, we have our weekly topics. It's great to be able to go back to the theaters. That's I love to, Fridays and busy. My, Friday's my busiest day now. You know, I, I do everything. I work, obviously, during the day. But then I find the time to go to, to the theater if I can, if it's something I'm watching at home, it's a little easier, but I, I like the whole theater thing, I'm going back, you know, so I, I, I fit that in, and then I record, and I even edit most of the episode, all on Friday, so that my weekend's more of a weekend, and it's, it's cool, uh, it's just the busiest day of my week, for sure, you know, we're keeping it moving all day here, by the time I sit down, and I, I think I'm going to be able to watch something, or read something. That's the thing. I really want to keep reading the book. I'm, I'm still, like, I want to binge. You know, I need, like, a vacation where I can just binge the uh, Star Wars Legends narrative. It would be fucking awesome. I can't fit it in as much as I would like, you know. I get so tired. I'm thinking I'm a, I need to be, like, a morning reader, you know. Fresh in the morning, like, I would love, that would, that should be my time frame for the reading. But I there's no way to, to squeeze that. On Saturdays and Sundays, I can squeeze that, but I, I just haven't done it yet. It still ends up always being afternoon and night, and at night during the week, I'm just, after writing, you know, after working all day and then writing, I start drifting while I'm reading it, and I don't want that. I want to be in it, you know? Uh, so... Just some things I've been learning here as we keep this train moving. Got to keep it moving. Got got to keep it. Got to keep that same energy, bro. Yeah, I think that's that's good for updates. I'm gonna keep it moving here, and we'll get into the news of the week. Um, 
yeah. So some interesting stuff this week. I posted some things. I'm gonna go into to top. I'm gonna go into uh, the main news topic, which which I saw, which was the most interesting thing this week. And so let's get into that. First thing I saw recently was that Amazon's Lord of the Rings series, which continues to have movement, just added another director to the project, and it is uh, Charlotte uh, Brandstrom, and she is a veteran writer of writer director of the outlander and the witcher so she is has played in that realm that genre plenty and so it makes sense for her to work on this so that's cool uh that's coming soon enough and it is one of the biggest things we will ever have on television ever i mentioned the budget a couple weeks ago so that's cool uh another thing i'm gonna watch is the witcher i'm gonna binge that Catherine Hahn joins an epic ensemble. So let's just get into the main topic of the news since I'm already right. It's right there. It was just, it was one day after the next. One day after the next this week, we had updates on the Knives Out sequel on Netflix from Ryan Johnson with Daniel Craig returning. And now they're just adding to this cast. And if, if the first one was any indication, it's an ensemble kind of thing. If this is a new mystery, a new case that Benoit Blanc is taking, right? Daniel Craig's character. It's he Ryan Johnson's still gonna play with that very ensemble, multi perspective thing. Um, but I think this one maybe takes even more of a a, a uh, Benoit Blanc approach. You know, he is the protagonist of this. I also think it expands beyond just one sequel. It's gonna be some kind of bigger thing. I don't know if he has a TV show in mind down the road. I just know that he, he the amount of money that Netflix spent on his Knives Out projects, I think it's plural. I think it's meant to be something bigger than a sequel. Don't quote me on that, but I think there's a chance it's bigger than just one sequel. It might be multiple, um, but they have moved forward here with who we will be seen in this sequel. One day after the next, just kept seeing names. They started with Dave Bautista. So Dave Bautista joined the cast. Uh, you would know him best from Guardians of the Galaxy, probably, obviously, as Drax the Destroyer. Um, which, something else with that this week, which I'll get into. But uh, also, Edward Norton. And then, uh, Jin, Jin, uh, was it, Jin? yeah, Janelle Monet too, yeah. Yeah, so Janelle Monet, and then finally to cap it off, Catherine Hahn, who we saw recently as the villain of WandaVision. Has, has, these are the people who have joined the cast of the Knives Out sequel. Uh, it's shaping up to be something pretty big. The amount of money being spent on it, and now this, this next cool and creative ensemble cast surrounding Daniel Craig's character. The first one had that, and the second one seems to be following suit, and I'm very excited for it. So that is very cool. Another thing, personal little uh, guilty pleasure here. I'm a, I'm a fan of Sebastian Maniscalco, the comedian. Hilarious, hilarious comedian. He has a movie in the works that's called About My Father, and it's loosely based on his father. Sicilian upbringing, um, old school Sicilian character. But I think the actual story is something fictional that he's just kind of working and, and using his own experiences to make something of. And they have casted Robert De Niro to play uh, Maniscalco's father. So that's interesting stuff. I mean, I, this is cool movement considering, you know, uh, years back there was supposed to be a, a TV series that Maniscalco was supposed to do, you know, a, loosely ba based on his life and, and it, um, they even shot it and, and, and just didn't get picked up. Tony Danza was playing his father. It was, it, he, he released the un, unreleased, um, the unaired pilot on, on Instagram, on IGTV for people. I remember watching it. It seemed funny. And I'm glad that he's doing something. It's cool to see that he's doing something now in the, you know, in the same realm of that show that he wanted to do. So that's cool. Another thing, this was big this week. This Is Us, hit series This Is Us, is coming to an end with its sixth season. So the sixth season will be the final season of This Is Us on NBC. 
a show that now I can actually binge from start to finish. I have not seen an episode of it. I know my mom loves it. I know other people love it. I'm going to watch it at some point. Now I can binge it all the way through. It is coming to an end. Miss Marvel updates. Apparently there was a resurgence of COVID in Thailand where they were filming the series. Disney Plus series is set to come out either the end of this year or the beginning of next year. Uh, It's another great Marvel project coming and it sets up the character we will all come to know very well over the next decade. This character, Kamala Khan, is a big character in the comics, will be a big character in the MCU. She will be in the Captain Marvel sequel. She is one of the Marvels in the Marvels coming. Um, And it looks like they completed all of their filming in Thailand despite that resurgence. So there is no stoppage. There's no breakage. There's no delaying of that. They are still on track. And so whenever they plan to release this, it seems it will be released at that time. So that's good news. What else happened? Besides all of the people that joined that sequel, the Venom Let There Be Carnage trailer dropped. It was underwhelming, if I'm being honest. It was, uh, I mean, funny. There was a funny moment I liked, that whole opening. But I'm still, uh, I'm still on, on the fence about what Sony's doing. And look, I, you know, as time has gone on here, it's not like I think everything should just be straight up in the MCU and, and, and that's it, you know. I, I think it, it, it's okay if stories, Marvel stories, want to exist outside of the MCU, but I just don't know how you do that as effectively as you possibly can when the MCU is as effective as it is, is as big as it is, is as good as it is because of the quality of the MCU and and it being as good as it is anything you do outside of it has to be as good or better so if it's not it's very hard for fans to get on board and the first venom was decent right it was it was fu- it was funny it, it had good action in it but it, overall it was an okay film and it didn't live up to what we had all see, what we see the MCU doing you know and that's why, and don't get me wrong, casting's good, everything. Like, I love Tom Hardy as Eddie Brock. It's fine. And, you know, I just think there needs to be some kind of workage here because they set up Venom to be kind of like in the same style as MCU films. That film feels like a bad MCU movie. So... And I say that because it's not as good. I'm not saying it's completely shit and it's just bad. I'm just saying that it's not as good. So it feels like a, one of the w- worst MCU movies. Like like how Thor The Dark World is, in my opinion, the worst MCU movie. It, it's on par with that movie. You know, for, for quality and for how good it was. And so, but the style of it feels an MCU. So that's why it needs, if you're going to do that make the approach to Venom in any of these films in this Sony Spider-Verse kind of an adjacent to multiverse of the MCU, and it all works for me. If you're going to do Marvel stories outside of the MCU and you want them to be separate, separate, then take a totally different approach. The style of it should be completely different. You know, films like when Deadpool returns to us, it, it will be different. It won't. It'll be like how they've always been, and they don't feel like MCU, and that's why it's going to work. Um, Deadpool won't just be in the MCU, and he's fighting alongside fucking, you know, Anthony Mackie's Captain America. It's not going to just work like that. Like, it, you know, if they integrate him in, it'll be very delicately, very specifically. Just like how I th- I'm starting to think the Netflix Marvel characters, when they return most likely be on Hulu and separate still you know all these rumors about oh Matt Murdock's gonna show up in Spider-Man Jessica Jones is gonna show up in She-Hulk why are we why are you, you think if they do it, it has to be done right um and if they don't that's gonna be fine with me and most fans I think because you have to keep that s- same tone do you know what I mean? The tones don't match up. And in order for them to 
coexist, you would have to brain bring one tone down and another tone up slightly so that they're kind of they'd have to make it work and i just don't know it, it almost seems like keeping those characters separate but then yes maybe still integrating them in delicate and specific ways like deadpool it'll work i have faith in kevin feige at the end of the day i'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt but that trailer dropped and the film comes soon and i think woody harrelson being in it is cool as we finally get a live action carnage so i'm that's cool definitely go check it out i posted it too if you want to just jump quick to my page to see it um guardians of the galaxy 3 will likely be dave batista's final time playing Drax. He's also on board with recasting Drax, but I'm so not, and neither is James Gunn or anybody else. It, it just doesn't... It just doesn't... You can't recast the character. It's not like... You know, it's like, yeah, people keep bringing up, well, they recasted Rhodey. They recasted Bruce Banner. Yeah, but we only spent one film with those characters, and then they were recast. We spent four films with... Dave Batista's Drax. You can't recast that character now. It's too late. Just like you can't recast T'Challa. You can't recast T'Challa. It does not work. I don't care what anybody says. Some people are now being like, well, they could actually maybe make that work. No. No, I don't. I just don't see it. The only way that kind of stuff works is if you like... The way... S I've said this before. You could have... Th the way that there could be multiple Peter Parkers from different dimensions... That's how you do those things. You have another Drax from another dimension played by someone else. Can Marvel do it? Sure. Will they do it? We'll have to find out. James Gunn also said he's most likely most likely done after Guardians 3, but then he also said never say never for Guardians 4. So, yeah, playing with us a little bit there. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much the news of the week. Fox is not moving forward with some of its projects. It was going to do a Goonies reenactment drama that is, it is now not doing, along with some other ones. But for the most part, that is the news of the week. So we will move into our topic. And our topic this week is Wrath of Man, the next film, the latest film by Guy Ritchie. Guy Ritchie, if you don't know is one of the most stylistically creative directors of our time. He's done films like Snatch. He's done Revolver, uh, Rock and Rolla. He's done the Sherlock Holmes films, the first two, with Robert Downey Jr. and Jude Law. Love those films. It's, it's sad that he's not doing the third. I like his style for those films, but he's not returning for the third. Um, and most recently he did The Gentleman, which is one of my favorite films of the last few years. And this film, I didn't even know he was, I didn't know anything about it. Uh, I saw the trailer when everyone else did, posted the trailer. And I think it's cool right off the bat for one thing. There it is again, right off the fucking bat. Uh, I think it's cool that, for starters, um... Jason Statham is in this film because it is the first time that Guy Ritchie and Jason Statham have worked together in 16 years. They started their careers together. You know, Guy Ritchie's first film, um, what was it? Lock, Stock, and Two Smoke and Barrels. That was also Jason Statham's first feature film. And then they did Snatch together and then they did Revolver together. And now, and, and, and then after Revolver, nothing until this. So it's cool to have them reunited for this project. Uh, Statham obviously went on to have, quite, to have quite a successful career. Quite He is he is the definition of a movie star. And um, Guy Ritchie is a very prominent director. Um, and so the big thing with this film that I was thinking was, oh, it's just another Jason Statham action movie, which... When I'm in the mood for, I like, but I'm not going to go see this, really. And then I saw that Guy Ritchie was doing it, and I thought, well, maybe it's not quite what I think. Why don't we give this a shot? 
and it turned out to be exactly that. You know, it, it it's not your typical action movie. It didn't end up being that. And I'm glad it wasn't because it what it was was very exciting. You know, it turned into more of like this action mystery thing, and and with elements of crime and with elements of drama thrown in there that are quite quite effective. Um, as usual with Guy Ritchie movies, I think the the structuring of it was something I enjoyed. I love when films are thrown into chapters and then structured in a specific order, non-linearly, to m- make a twist land harder or hit differently. Oh, shit, I forgot to check. I forgot to check. I wanted to double-check. So if I'm wrong about this, I apologize, but I haven't seen him in... You know, I, did, I haven't... He's a, he's a good actor, but I haven't seen him in a lot of things that you know that I've personally watched. I know he's been around for a little bit now, but Clint Eastwood's son, Scott Eastwood, I am pretty sure is the villain in this. Um, I think that's Scott Eastwood, and if I'm wrong, I'm sorry, but I think it is, and he did great if it was. He was really fun to watch on screen. There was, there was this thing about the film being structured the way it was that we spent chapters with... There was almost a Rashomon effect. And if you don't know what that is, you, you're not a film guy or girl, gal. You're not a film person. You, you don't have a knowledge of film, of cinema, if you don't know what the film Rashomon is by um, Akira uh, uh, Kurosawa. Um, it is it is this idea that we see this event. You know, everything gravitates towards this one event that kicks off this movie. The movie starts with a robbery, and we don't, we just see it, and it's it's abrupt, and then it ends abruptly, and we move on to something else, but it, it, it is the centerpiece of everything that happens, and we see it from multiple perspectives, so we spend a chapter seeing, we go backwards a couple of times, we spend a chapter seeing it from H's point of view, right, Jason Statham's character, the protagonist, we see we see it again from the villain's point of view, this group of guys who did it, and then we have our real-time um, progression of the story, which which leads us to our conclusion, where these forces collide. We have H out for revenge, which we don't learn right away, which is good. The, you know, Structurally, it worked pretty much perfectly for me. I will say that the end... That whole robbery at the end was was a little bit dragged out. That went on a little longer than I would have wanted it to. It it it, it was a lot. It was it just kept going and it was a lot. But the conclusion was was good enough for me that I I was it it was a good payoff that it was worth the wait. It's like watching a good TV show and you're waiting for this. It's building. It's building. You're like, come on, it's gonna do. It's gonna take this turn, right? And then it finally does, and it was worth the wait. It was kind of like that. But more to the point, if they hadn't revealed what they revealed at the points that they revealed it, it wouldn't have worked as well either. So structurally, we don't know things, and we're curious for a good amount of time, which is good. You know, it's it just it became more of a crime mystery. Than, than just an action movie. It's less an action movie than I thought. Like, it's very much not an action movie until that third act. And even then, it's not like your typical Jason Statham is, is, is just beating up people and, sh- and, and just kicking ass. It's not that movie. It's not, a, it's not that kind of movie at all. And I'm, it was different. I, I liked the difference. So that was cool. Structurally, the chapters and everything. The character of H was interesting because you it, it was so effective to learn that he's actually a he's as bad a guy as any bad guy we meet. And in a lot of ways what happens to his son is his fault because it's his it's like this energy, this 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 chaotic energy, this evil energy of his work and what he does does gravitate towards him. So something like this happening to him is not out of the realm of possibility. And it definitely could have happened in a different scenario, in in a different way. Like, it could have been directly caused by his own work. Even though it wasn't, 
it could have been. And that's why I think maybe that's why I think it helped his character because underneath there is a guilt, obviously, and a blaming himself and his work and what he does for what happened to his son. But the wrath of man takes on more meaning than than just the basics, right? It's it's the wrath of our protagonist, the basic uh natural, you know, animalistic instinct of man to to hunt those who who um caused you pain and took some, took the the person you loved most from you the you know so the vengeance factor the wrath that comes down on these men is is a natural thing that happens but also the villains spending the time we do with them they were em- they were empathized very effectively so you actually care about them at certain points um and then we do get the the arc of one of those characters turning into the the actual villain as he progresses through he be played by scott eastwood i'm pretty sure uh he he just becomes a full-blown villain that our hero needs to take down and of course it's of course it's the same guy who actually pulled the trigger and killed h's son in the first place so the way that uh, there's also the there was a, it was an effective thing to have the bad guys seem like they're gonna win. Spending the time we do with them, it almost helped the the ending hit and land harder because you can believe for a second, okay, maybe the bad guys win, and I'm kind of okay with that because it we've learned a lot about them and and it's. It's just realistic. Sometimes the bad guy wins. So this is what we get. And because of that, because of that feeling that came up for me for a second, it made the actual final scene have that much more of an impact. The way that H wins. The way that H sneakily finds a way to track the bad guy and beat the bad guy. Um... Every chapter title was said by a character in the said chapter. And so that final one was the most powerful, right? It was the liver, the lungs, the spleen, and the heart. And it, and without giving it completely away, it was a powerful enough ending for me. Um, that guy, Richie, you know... That's what I told. I even told my dad before I went and saw. I was like, "Yeah, it's probably going to be a Jason Statham action movie, but you know what? With Guy Ritchie at the helm, it's going to have that feel and style. So it'll be an action movie, but it'll be more on par with the Gentleman." And then I saw the movie, and it actually was way more on par with the Gentleman than I thought it would be, and less an action movie. This is very enjoyable for the fact that it is a crime mystery there's the jason statham action you would want there's some good plot points throughout there's a couple good twists uh the twists are not that uh, um they were they're not that like holy shit i didn't see that coming some of them are are not i don't want to say obvious but easy to track you know, easy to have predicted in some some way, shape, or form. The the guy he gets closest with, when when we we keep learning, there's there's an inside man, there's an inside man. I'm like this, the guy he's closest with has got to be the guy, and then it ends up being the guy. But um, just the way things are slowly revealed was the best part of this. We spend a good amount of time, maybe halfway, half of the movie. Just trying to learn what's actually going on. And that's good because if they had revealed anything too quickly, it wouldn't have been as it wouldn't have worked as well. And yeah, I was on the edge of my seat sometimes. And I wanted to just see who would come out on top. And that's why we stick with this movie, you know, all the way to the end. Um it's probably something I still need to mull over more, but 
overall, the fact that it's different than your typical action movie is what really made it work for me. Um, there are there are some things that I was thinking about in the theater. So sh- just the way it's edited sometimes, very Guy Ritchie. Um, there's some of the quick, rapid edits, but also some of the inserts, some of the shots. Like they had these like quick. He had these quick, like, zoom-ins and zoom-outs that I liked. Um, Yeah, just really stylistically not... It's just, like, a different kind of... Probably one of the most badass kind of, like, non... Like, an action movie without being completely an action movie kind of thing. You know what I mean? Um, You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Great, now I'm going to sing on every episode. Is that Drake? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that is. Yeah. Um, But my overall rating of it is an 8.3 out of 10. It's good. Um, Definitely go see it. I think it's only in theaters right now. So if you want to see it, you gotta go see it in a theater, and you should. We need to support the reopening of theaters and get that business going again because we need theaters. We need the experience of going to a movie theater and seeing something in a movie theater. So definitely go see this film. I'm looking forward to what Guy Ritchie has for us going forward. You know, he has a couple of things that I've noticed. He's doing a, a TV series for the gentleman. He's doing a. Uh, just I, he's a filmmaker I thoroughly enjoy. Enjoy watching his films, um, but yeah, I'm. If it wasn't as deep in an analysis as normal, I apologize. But how deep can you go with with an action movie, um, or even a crime mystery like this? It's very straightforward, and um, I enjoyed it. I did. I enjoyed it. Um, yeah. So let's move on to a couple of segments. And I wanted to bring up my new approach to some of this because I'm not going to do a movie quote of the week anymore. And here's why. I don't want to keep looking for one every week (laughs) and having to memorize it. That's for starters. I'm just too fucking busy as it is, and I've gotten busier too. Um, it's easier, I think, if I just do like a couple of recommendations. So my new segments. I I'm glad some people get involved on the Instagram. I throw up the quote, and like people, some people do try to guess, but for the most pe- part, people don't. So it's not even a segment worth doing anymore. Um. So we're going to just, it's, and it's good to switch it up too. It's always good to switch things up, right? I've changed this show f- quite a bit over the, over the past year alone. I, I like the, I like there should be an evolution of it and it should continue. Um, so the next segment is going to be this recommendation segment that I'm going to do instead. The facts are my favorite and so I will continue those and they're always fun and good and people like to learn things about movies that they didn't maybe know so it makes sense to keep doing that i'm also learning things that i didn't know so it makes sense to keep doing it for that reason and like i said we're keeping it all within the theme of richie in some way shape or form so this week maybe we can recall snatch that being the film that kicked off Guy Ritchie's career in a lot of ways. But my recommendation actually is is the film that actually kicked off his, his career. But nonetheless, Snatch being one of his first, has some interesting facts about budget and such behind it. The 2000 film Snatch was a low-budget, gritty, almost slapstick kind of production all around. Interestingly enough... Actors loved his first film, Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels, so much they reached out to Richie looking to be in this film. Brad Pitt called up Richie and asked to play a role. 
He got cast as Mickey and was easily the biggest actor in the film at that point. Funny enough, this cost Richie being able to cast anyone else big. Sean Connery reached out as well, looking to play the role of Bricktop, but Richie couldn't afford him. Richie could barely afford enough extras. Brad Pitt's evolution into the character of Mickey is most interesting. Did you know that his thick, pikey accent was purposefully vague? Pitt couldn't do a regular English accent as well as Richie had liked, so he switched it to pikey and wished for basically no one to understand him on purpose, even the rest of the cast. Another part of Pitt's preparation involved not bathing much during production to fit the gypsy-style living of his character. All around, Snatch is perhaps one of the most obscure, creative, and interesting films to ever come out of the cinema. Dogs. What? Yeah, dogs. Dogs? You like dogs? Oh, dogs. Sure. I like dogs. A debate, a topic here. Last week I mentioned who was the best first-time director nominee for an Oscar, and I posted it, um, and I still stand by Sam Mendes, even though Emerald Fennell and Jordan Peele are up there too. Um, this week... I ask you this, because it's a fun one, considering his movie star status and the films that he's done and all these big action heroes he's played. Who is the best Jason Statham character? That's not so easy to answer, is it? I don't think it is. And I don't think everyone has the same answer for the, who's, who's the best one in your opinion. I, I'm going to give you my top seven or so, but I think... Yeah, I think, like, I almost wanted to pick Lee Christmas from The Expendables, but most people are going to pick Frank Martin. I pick Frank Martin from The Transporter, but Lee Christmas is my number two. Turkish from Snatch. Jensen Ames from Death Race. Phil Broker from Homefront. Homefront is probably the one of the best Jason Statham movies because, like Wrath of Man, it's different. Um... And then Deckard Shaw from Fast and Furious, Arthur Bishop from The Mechanic. My top seven, personally. So yeah, what what are yours? Or what's just what's your number one? I think most people would pick Frank Martin. Frank Martin kicks ass. So here is the new segment, Recommendations of the Week. I'm going to recommend a movie you should watch, a TV show you should watch, and then sometimes a book you should read and a video game you should play if I have one, if I have those two in mind. I won't, I won't always because it's a lot to, like, to, you know, I, I've only just really started reading novels a lot more in the last four or so years. So I don't have a lot of book recommendations. But, and games, I can, I'm going to do more of than the books even, honestly. But it won't always be new shit. Like, this week it's not... I've replayed old shit that I think you can still play and fucking have so much fun playing. Um, the movie you should definitely check out is Lock, Stock, and Two Smoke and Barrels. It was Guy Ritchie's first film, and it kind of... It, it shows that style that we love about Snatch and then have come to love about his other films. And it's just worth checking out that, that film that started it all for Ritchie. It's a good little movie, you know? The TV show you should check out is The Outsider on HBO, and that's also the book you should read. Uh, it's a Stephen King book, and the show is based on the book. came out, I want to say, two years ago now, uh, and it was a pretty big thing when it was on, and it's good. It's good. You know, the, I would recommend maybe reading the book first. That's what I did. The book is better in some ways. The show is better in some ways. I think the best thing about it being on TV and not a movie is obviously adapting a, a book is always best when adapted to a TV series. Game of Thrones is the perfect example of that. The Outsider was another good example of that. It just makes more sense. Long-form storytelling, you, have, you can fit in a lot more of the actual adapting of, of the, original, um, the original story. And then the game I recommend playing, I was a big fan of the Ninja Gaiden games growing up. I have been repl I've, I've replayed the second one. 
and you can replay that, and it's still fun as fuck. The thing about Ninja Gaiden, I played Ninja Gaiden 2 as a kid, and it was the hardest game I ever played. As I play it now, I think to myself, is this the hardest game I've ever played, or is it poorly put together? Because it's one or the other. Because I'm hitting the buttons right, and it's just not on par with me. I beat it again for the second time, and I got hooked on trying to beat it again for the third time on a harder difficulty because you can, every time you beat the game, you can play it again at a harder difficulty, and it just gets harder and harder and harder. So I'm like, holy shit, this, it makes it, it keeps it fun. I keep trying to beat these fucking spider bosses, and I can't do it. And then finally, one day, I randomly do it. It's a fun game. If you played it the when it when it came out, you'll enjoy replaying it. And also this week, there was a little something on that caught my attention, but it caught most people's attention because one of the this is cool where we actually talk about music a little bit on this show too, don't we? The J. Cole album, The Off Season, finally dropped. And J. Cole is one of the goats, okay? He's in my top 20 of all time. And lately I've been rearranging my top 50 because I've been listening to a lot of different stuff. Um, Like it's way more solid what my top like 40 or so rappers are. And finally this album, and this album is so good. And he is one of the goats, and he's in my top 20. Definitely go check out The Fall Off. No. the fa- See, that's the thing. He, he, People think he's going to drop another one called The Fall Off because he kept hinting at it. But then he dropped The Off Season. So is there going to be two albums, or did he just change the title? Maybe he just changed the title, people. Definitely go check that out. As usual, shout out to my patrons. Shout out to the people who keep supporting me. We have a merch drop coming in June because of these people. We have um, other promotions coming because of these these patrons, these screen preachers. Billy Thomas, Jessica Murphy, Michael Morganti, Dylan Morganti, Tijan Construction, Linda Morganti, thank you for your support, and you can also all become a patron or become a, become a screen preacher by going to patreon.com slash preacher and becoming, becoming a patron of the show. Just stuff. You get merch. You, you get... The merch drops coming in June. These people right here are getting the merch. Nobody else is getting the merch. Just, just these people... And me, because obviously, me, I sit here, I do this. Tapped it. I tapped it. Go get them. Uh, definitely go uh, follow the show at Screen Preach. Follow me at the Benji. I'm sorry. Follow the show at Screen Preach. Give the title a minute. Follow me personally at DeBenji. I am a screenwriter at heart. This is my hobby. You you need to s- go check out my actual work. At De- DeBenji's my actual personal. For the screenplays, I'm still going to put them on Screen Preach. So I don't know what I'm talking about. Where you want to go is eventmorgantistory.com. That is where my work is. So go visit the website of all websites. Whoa, getting getting fucking getting big ego on you there, man. And subscribe to BMS Studios on YouTube, where you can find the episodes of Screen Preach, where you can find other content. And um, yeah, I already mentioned Patreon. Thank you for watching and listening. As you, uh, however you do it, and every week. Thank you for doing it, however you do it, every week. And come back next week. Not sure what I'm going to do yet, but there's a lot of options, plus things keep coming out now, finally, in theaters. So this will be fun as we get back into a normal season of movie going. Thanks, guys. Have a cinematic week. 
I used to say that. I'm going to say it again. Have a cinematic week and watch movies in the name of the Godfather, the Son of Odin, and the Holy Jedi.